If you have questions, uh, just leave them in the chat and uh, David will keep track of ones and, and maybe kind of put the, the ones he thinks are most relevant up to the top for when it comes time for that. Uh, but we're going to get started tonight with a prayer and Taylor has a, a prayer of Luther's for us to begin. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you did not spare your only son, but gave him up for us all to be our savior. And along with him, you have graciously given us all things. We thank you for your precious saving gospel. And we pray that you would help us to believe in the name of our savior faithfully and steadfastly for he alone is our righteousness and wisdom, our comfort and peace so that we may stand on the day of his appearing. Through Jesus Christ, your dear son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, so, Doctor. The floor is yours. Oh, Professor. all right. Um, so um, I guess I'm talking to Methodists and a bunch of pastors and about, um, about- And church people. What? And church people. And, and church people. Some church people who have uh, completed a class that David and I did on Luther recently. So, so they know their stuff. You I hope Luther before and done a little bit of Luther. Before <laughs> I mean, most people have heard various stories about Luther, but not too many people learn much of his theology. Um, and that's what got me into th doing this stuff is because I, I really love the theology. Um, it, yeah, maybe it's, it's useful to start by sort of giving a couple of background uh, bits of information about how I got interested in, in this stuff. Um, I was thinking that if you really want to know a person, you can't know a person just by looking at them or observing or seeing them. You have to listen because persons have the authority to speak for themselves. Um, they have an authority to say who they are. And this goes double for God because we're not going to be able to see God and understand God with our minds. We have to listen to what God has to say for himself. Um, and if we're not willing to listen to God's word, we're not going to know who God is. So that that contrast between seeing and hearing turned out to be an important one for me. Um, and um, I, I've written a book called um, The Meaning of Protestant Theology, The Gospel That Gives Us Christ. And the key notion is the gospel that gives us Christ, a word that we hear that tells us who our God is and gives us the God that it tells us about. But that comes by hearing, right? Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, as opposed to seeing and understanding. Um, and this is a, a contrast that is important in the book because Augustine, who's the, the other major theologian in, in, in the book that I, I'm writing here, um, is, is very much about seeing because seeing is a great, metaphor for understanding when we want to see things for ourselves right so if you're doing a, if you're learning math for instance you can you know hear what the math teacher says and believe that it's true and maybe you're right maybe you know something by you know second hand by believing it but really you want to see it for yourself you want to say aha now i see it now i get it right so that's one model of knowledge seeing it for yourself and that's a good model for mathematics. You know, in the end, you don't want to re rely on what your math teacher tells you. You want to see it for yourself. But I think that's not a good model for how we know persons. For knowing persons, you need to trust them and listen to them, you know, unless they're liars. If they're liars, then you might want to see through a liar. But don't try that with God, right? With God, we need to trust what he has to say for himself. So th here's this funny thing. Um, the urge to have firsthand knowledge, to see it for yourself, is not what really works when it comes to knowing other persons. Knowing other persons is always, in a deep way, secondhand. You have to trust what the other person has to say for themselves. You have to trust their witness about who they are. Um, it has this secondhand structure. It's what you hear about, right, rather than what you see for yourself. But then, Here's the thing that, that Luther insists on that, that's so striking. When we hear God's word, it's, well, we don't see for ourselves. We don't figure this out for ourselves. We don't use our own reason. Luther warns about that all the time. Don't use your own reason. Listen to God's word. And yet, 
it's not just something secondhand because uh, as the subtitle of my book says, um, and, and this is a central concept I think in Luther's whole theology, the gospel gives us Christ. A word can give us a person. So the model that I end up using all the time, which Luther also uses quite frequently, is a wedding vow. Right? A wedding vow doesn't just make somebody known. A wedding vow is a way that one person gives themselves to another. We do this with promises all the time. But the wedding vow, I think, is probably the deepest kind of promise here, because you're promising a whole life. But when we promise ourselves to each other, right, we are using our words to give ourselves to each other. Um, sometimes the gesture is like, like shaking hands, like, I'll work with you. You can trust me, right? We'll work together. I'll do my part of the job. Let's shake hands on it, right? The gesture is kind of, uh, kind of sacramental, and I'll get back to sacraments in a minute. It's, it's like a gesture that says, ah, you can trust me. I'm going to give you my work. Not my whole self, right? Handshakes are not forgiving the whole self, right? Marriage is forgiving the whole self. But you, you give something of yourself to another through your word. And if you're honest and keep your word, then you're actually making yourself known and you're giving yourself to be known. Luther thinks the gospel works that way. It's God giving himself to be known through the promise of Christ. And it's like a wedding vow because the promise actually gives the one who, who makes the promise. Uh, it's a word that gives what it signifies. And this is why I'll, I'm gonna talk about uh, later, uh, it's essentially a sacramental word because sacraments are external signs that give what they signify. Well, the gospel is an external word that gives what it signifies because what it signifies is Christ. So that's what I want to think about today with you folks. Um, and I think what I'll do is, is I'll set a bunch of things on the table and introduce a bunch of things and then wait for people to ask questions um, because I don't know exactly where you all are and, and what kind of questions you wanna ask. But let me set a few things on the table. And then um, folks, th those of you who are monitoring the chat and the questions, when the questions start getting overwhelming, you know, stop me and I'll, I'll talk about the questions because I'm used to teaching seminars and I like, you know, I like stopping and asking uh, and, and answering questions. But let's, let's get started on this notion of the gospel as the word that gives us Christ, the word of God that gives us Christ, the sacramental word that's an external word that gives what it signifies to those who believe. What's going on here? Well, this is tied to the famous Protestant belief in justification by faith alone. Oftentimes people are very puzzled what this means. And many times Protestants have kind of given up on this notion these days anyways, um, because it's, it's um, well, it was an urgent doctrine in the 16th century in Luther's time. It's less urgent now and people don't quite understand what it means. But you're, you're gonna be saved just by believing you're saved? How does that work, right? Um, Luther says actually, believe it and you have it. He says that in a number of different versions, believe it and you have it. But how could he possibly say that? Well, because what you believe when you're saved by faith alone, what you believe is the gospel, which gives what it, what it promises. So when he says, believe it and you have it, he's talking about believing the promise of Christ. You believe that promise and you have what's promised. Um, you don't normally get what you believe just by believing it. But if you're believing in the promise of God, who keeps his word and who's true to his word, then you simply by believing it, you have it. Why? Because God is true to his word. And this is another moment of Luther's thought that's really worth thinking about. Luther loves the saying in Paul, in Romans 3, I believe it is, let God be true and every man a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. Um, and what that means is if Christ makes you a promise, and Christ is God, of course, Luther's absolutely convinced of that, then you can absolutely depend on that promise being true, right? Even if you're a liar, even if your own faith is inadequate, 
insincere and part of the time you feel like you're an unbeliever because actually you are and you need to repent of your unbelief all the time right even if your faith is inadequate that's that's neither here nor there what matters is whether god is going to be true to his word justification by faith alone does not mean you make a decision for jesus and then that saves you right you'll never hear that in luther never because that would be relying on your own free will to be saved. And Luther hates that, right? Relying on your own free will, it turns out, Luther thinks, is a kind of slavery. Free will is really a kind of slavery because it means you're constantly trying to do enough to get saved. And you're on this treadmill like, oh, if I only was good enough or righteous enough or believed enough and really had a strong faith, if I really surrendered my life to Jesus, then I'd be saved. But maybe I haven't really surrendered my life to Jesus. Maybe I really haven't made that sincere decision. Um, so there's a kind of treadmill there that's really disastrous. And it's typical of a certain kind of Protestantism that doesn't think about salvation by faith the way Luther does. So let's say just a little bit about that, because this may be a familiar kind of treadmill. Um, I learned, well, I've learned about it from my students. I've learned about it from myself, but I also learned about it. Uh, from a little book called Stop Asking Jesus Into Your Life. Um, great, great little title, right? Um, it's by J.D. Greer, who is, I think, just until recently, the, the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Right? So this is a guy who's, who's been influential. Um, he said, um, he wrote this while he was still a pastor and not yet um, a head honcho over at the Southern Baptist Convention. But um, what he said is this, he must have given his life to Jesus 5,000 times. And he really meant that, right? Quite literally, he must have given his life to Jesus 5,000 times. Also got baptized four or five times as well because he was never really sure that he really meant it, right? And your whole salvation, he thought, depended on really making that decision. This is why Luther thinks that free will is a form of bondage and slavery because you keep on trying to really make that decision and you keep on failing and you keep on trying again and it it doesn't work right and it drives you deeper and deeper into anxiety and you keep on trying to do something to make it better well this is what justification by works is for luther the thing about justification by works as opposed to justification by faith and i, and I hope all of us protestants know that contrast right the thing about justification by works is that it's all about something that we do to get saved, right? And the problem with anything we do, including making a decision for Jesus or asking Jesus into our life, anything we do is something we can ask, have you done it well enough? Have you done a good enough job? And Luther says the answer to that question is always no. No, right? what you have done, Luther says, is mortal sin, all of it. Everything you do is worthy of nothing but damnation if, if God judged it strictly. So stop trying to do stuff to get saved. It doesn't work, right? Now, some people hear that and, and it, it seems terrifying. It seems that we're helpless. And Luther thinks, well, when it comes to justification by works, we are helpless. When it comes to the law of God, we are helpless, but not with the gospel. But that means that the gospel can't be this kind of thing where, um, where you, it gives you a technique to get saved. The gospel will not tell you how to get saved because that would give you something to do and that would be that same kind of bondage that J.D. Greer was having, right? Um, oh, by the way, real quick note, nothing wrong with asking Jesus into your life if you want to, I'm fine, but just don't think that that saves you right? Ask Jesus, ask Jesus into your life all you want, but it's, it can't save you, right? So what saves you? What do you think the gospel tells you about what saves you? Uh, maybe it's about Jesus Christ, right? <laughs> that is, it's not about what you do. It's not even about how you believe in Jesus, right? Believing in Jesus is, is ob obedience to the first commandment of the Ten Commandments. Uh, <laughs> Luther. You're getting a lot of amens and hallelujahs right now, just so you know, in the chat. Oh, amen from the Luther. Okay. All right. So, I mean, Luther thinks that, you know, believing in Jesus is obedience to the first of the Ten Commandments. Yeah. But that means faith itself is an act of obedience. Faith itself is something we do. The gospel is not about anything we do, because anything we do is a work. 
right? And anything we can do, we can ask, have you done it well enough? And the answer is no. Who does something well enough to save us? Duh, it's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The gospel is a story about Jesus Christ. In the gospel, it's Christ who does stuff, not us. So the content of the gospel is not a how-to, it's not instructions about getting saved, it doesn't give us anything to do, right? The content of the gospel sounds like, well, sounds like this is my body, it's given for you, or I'm going to be with you for, for the, to the end of the age, right? Um, or uh, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a, a phrase that Luther loves and bases on the, the promise of the keys. So in the gospel, we have a story about what Christ does, not about what we do. And that's really just the fundamental difference between gospel and law, according to Luther. There's, um, um, yeah, there's a, um, maybe I can find you my, um, can I share my screen with you guys and show you this? Because I, I think the, um, the best um, one page statement about law and gospel in Luther is um, this thing that, uh, okay. Um, is this thing, I'll, I'll just read it to you. Um, uh, before, before you go there, you mentioned one thing that I, I think uh, people would appreciate clarification on. Sure. What is the office of the keys? Oh, the office of the keys goes back to Jesus promising that um, uh, to Peter um, that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Luther understands this to be a promise to the whole church, not just to Peter, not just to a priest, right? It's a priest of, priesthood of all believers. So any believer can pronounce to you the absolution of your sins. Now, it's best if it's a pastor and, and, and a kind of quasi-sacramental context. And actually, there's, there's some details to talk about there. But the, but the foundation of this promise is, in fact, the gospel promise in the gospels where Jesus says, whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Um, quick note about the Latin. The word for loose is solvere, from which we get solution, right? Solution means to dissolve. So um, the loosing is a dissolving of our sins. Uh, a related Latin verb is absolvere, from which we get our word absolution. So that's the, the, the foundation of the, of the word of absolution. Um, the promise of the keys to Peter, which is to all of us, is the promise that absolution in the name of Jesus Christ actually does forgive sins. So if you're worried about your sins, and you should be, Right, then the very best thing you can do is go to another Christian, preferably a pastor, but not necessarily, and talk about your sins. And then when the pastor says, and a pastor really should know to do this, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You should hear that as if Jesus Christ himself were saying, I absolve you of your sins. And then don't you dare call Jesus a liar. Right. This is right. Let God be true and every man a liar. So you may feel like you're still a sinner. You may still feel sinful in all sorts of ways. Don't believe your own heart. Your heart is a liar. Right. Believe the word of Christ. And so um, if, if Christ tells you that he absolves you of your sins, then you better you, you darn well better believe it because you don't have any right to call him a liar. Right. So there's this wonderful thing. Right. You're required to believe that Christ is your savior and forgives you your sins, right? You're commanded, right? It, with all of your inadequate belief, you're still commanded to believe that Christ absolved you of your sins, that he's your savior, that he died for you, that he shed his blood for you, because, and here's here we can get back onto the, 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 the previous track here, the promises of Christ, including the promise of the keys, the promises of Christ are um, nested in the larger story of Christ. And the gospel, is the story about who Jesus is and what he does. And at the center of it for Luther is, is these promises, right? But the promises are part of the story. Um, quick note, Lutherans will be familiar with this, but not everybody, I suppose. Um, when, when we say gospel and we're thinking about Luther, uh, we're not just talking about the four, the four gospels in the New Testament, right? We're not talking about just the four, four documents. Um, when Isaiah says, for unto us a child is born, 
and we sing it in Handel, for unto us a child is born. That's the gospel, right? Anything which teaches and preaches and sings the good news of Jesus Christ in accordance with the apostolic witness, including the, the, the prophets, including Paul, including the letter of Peter, um, all of that is gospel, right? So there's various ways of, of getting at the gospel and we can sing it, we can pray it, and it's not just those four, four documents, but it is the story of Christ. It's the story of what he does. So instead of this squirrel cage where you're trying to really give your heart to Christ and really let Jesus into your life, right? You simply believe that it's true when the gospel tells you that Christ died for you. You simply believe that it's true when Jesus says, this is my body, it's given for you, for you. And, and you believe that, that he really baptized you so that when you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you know that you are one of those for whom Christ died. You are one of those for whom Christ is Savior, right? You don't have a right to doubt that. And you do doubt it because you're an unbeliever as well as a believer. All of us believers are also unbelievers. All of us believers struggle with unbelief and sin. But the commandment simply says, don't call Christ a liar, believe that he's your savior. And there is a struggle for faith for Luther. And um, you know, if it was up to us to, to believe hard enough, then we'd be in trouble. But our salvation is not based on how well we believe. Our salvation is based on whether Jesus keeps his word. If Christ is true and every man is a liar, then we're, we're still saved, right? Because it really is up to him to keep his word. So that's enormously important for Luther, um, that distinction between the discourse of the gospel and the discourse of the law. And let me read that bit to you, because it's, um, it is in a little thing he says, uh, how, how Christians should regard Moses. Um, is, is the, the thing. It's, if, you, if you know your, your Luther red volumes, right, if, if you're a Luther scholar or something or a Lutheran pastor, you have these on your shelves. It's the red volume, volume 35, Word and Sacrament, volume one, and a little thing called How Christians Should Regard Moses. And on the second page of it, page 162 in volume 35, here's what Luther says. The first sermon or doctrine is the law of God, and the second is the gospel. So two different kinds of God's word, law and gospel. And Luther's famous for this, right? Now, Calvin believes it too, but I think Luther does it better for, for reasons that I'll, I'll, I'll try to get at. So these two sermons or words of God are not the same. By the way, it's really important. The law of God is God's word, right? but it's not, what's, it's not the word that saves us. Let's say more about it. Therefore, we must have a good grasp of the matter in order to know how to differentiate between, between the two of them. Here's that famous law gospel distinction that Lutherans make a big, big deal about. Well, the law commands and requires us to do certain things. Right? It's that simple. Right? The law is a certain kind of discourse. Any discourse that tells you what to do is at best law. Right? Maybe it's just you know, advice or instruction. At the very best, uh, it might be the law of God. Right? But if it's telling you what to do, it's not the gospel. That's a criterion. If it's telling you what to do, it's not the gospel. So the law is directed solely to our behavior and consists in making requirements. For God speaks through the law saying, do this, avoid this. This is what I expect of you. The gospel, however, does not preach what we are to do or what we are to avoid. It sets up no requirements. If you think like you have to get something done by your own free will, that's not the gospel, right? It sets up no requirements, but reverses the approach of the law, does the very opposite and says, this is what God has done for you. He has let his son be made flesh for you. He has let him be put to death for your sake. Right? And you can go on and on at this, right? You can recite the creed, you can sing a hymn, but it's about what Christ has done also about who Christ is and the promise he's made, right? All of that. So then there's two kinds of doctrine, two kinds of works, those of God and those of men. Just as we and God are separated from more than one another, so also these two doctrines are widely separated from one another for the gospel teaches exclusively what has been given us by God and not like the law, what we are to do and give to God. So it's, it's for Luther, I think it's really fundamentally that simple. 
The gospel is about what God does. The law is about what we do. Anything that tells us what to do is at best law, not gospel. The gospel will simply tell us what Christ has done. It won't even say you have to believe this, right? Because that's law. That's, that's actually the first of the Ten Commandments, Luther thinks, right? Um, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no gods but me. That's a commandment to have faith, which we're not very good at. So that can't save us. Christ saves us, and he makes the promise that he's going to save us, and we should believe that. Um, okay, so let's say just a little bit more about how the story works. Um, are we getting questions yet? Yeah, well, you know, this might be a good stopping point for now. There's, we have three more uh, sessions, so we don't have to rush through things. Um, why don't we... Um, you want to take a few questions? Take it away, David. Yeah, All right, take it away, David. So uh, Drew Colby, who is uh, a, a pastor here in Northern Virginia, uh, asks, this free gospel is so clear in the beginning or first half of so many of Paul's letters, uh -huh. but often Paul ends letters with exhortations to particular conduct. Mm -hmm. How does Luther or the Protestant tradition more generally understand right. this potential contradiction? Ah, right. Well, um, you could think of it as gospel and law, and they're not really contradictory. They're different kinds of discourse, right? Um, the discourse of law is doing something different than the discourse of gospel. Um, now, the tricky thing is, um, for those of you who know the, the, the ins and outs of this, is what to do about the third use of the law. So, so I'll label it that, and, and I won't explain why it's third, but, but um, let me, let's say a little bit about, about this. It seems to me, and I'm, I'm in, in the middle of, of starting to write a book about this, that we need two steps here. One is, here's the gospel. Here's what Jesus has done. Two is, here is the community of Christ's body that has been established by our Lord Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit to enliven us and make us his own. So that's also a, a, a statement of gospel, right? This, this is what God has done. He's made a church. He's brought you into the church. He's baptized you. He's made you one of his own. And then next step is really kind of descriptive step. Here's what the church does, right? First, here's what the church is, the body of Christ. Second, here's what the church does. Now, um, and then there's, there's actual commandments. Be the church. Do what the church does. Um, um, uh, think of, of 1 Corinthians 13. This lovely thing, which is, you know, they, they, they do it at weddings and so on, but it's not about weddings. It's about the church, right? Love bears all things, hopes all things, right? Above all, forgives all things. Bears, right? Love puts up with a whole lot of crap because you're in the church with a whole lot of people who are just as wounded and difficult and, and, and ornery as you are, right? So to be in the church is to be with a lot of people who are difficult to be with. And, you know, Jews and Gentiles, male and female, all, everybody's at each other's throats and, and you've got to learn to love each other, right? But first he describes it, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 is a description of the life of the church. Um, so in Paul's letters, you get this description and then you get this commandment, right? Be that church. Now, what does that mean? It means we should be that church. It means we really should do this. The law tells us what to do, and yeah, we should really do it. Do we really do it? Mm, right. Therefore, if you're in the church, one of the things you do is, is every Sunday, I hope you have some kind of liturgy of repentance and confession and absolution. Right. A good liturgy will have a, a moment of confession and repentance. Why? Because we fail to be the church. Right. Uh, this is not a contradiction. This is um, basically. Um, par for the course. I, mm, I need to say something about the notion of the Christian journey and the progress of the Christian life, but let's put that aside for just a second. Um, the point is, yeah, God commands us to do these things. We fail a lot, but we actually will also start to get better at it because the Holy Spirit is at work in us to change us and sanctify us and to, to take the word of Christ and, and, and form it in our hearts. So, Let's say a couple more things about law, right? Because we, um, that's only the beginning. Um, let's back up a second. Here's what might be the contradiction that you're thinking about. It goes back long before Luther, by the way, it goes back to, to Augustine, who in, in a treatise called On the Spirit and the Letter, 
uh, one of Luther's favorite writings by Augustine, he says, look, um, the law can't give you the power to do what the law tells you to do. That's the, the big disaster is to think, oh, if I tell people what to do, then they'll do it. If I'm a preacher and I give people advice about how to transform their lives, that will transform their lives, right? I tell them how to transform their lives, that'll transform their lives, right? Wrong, right? What will transform their, transform their lives is to preach the gospel because by preaching the gospel, you give them Christ. And what Luther suggests, and, and this I think is what's happening in, in Paul's letters, is by hearing the word of Christ, your heart is changed and, and formed and reformed in the image of Christ uh, by gladness and joy um, and comfort in the midst of sorrows and tribulations. Um, you hear the story of Christ and it changes you. It reforms you in the image of your beloved. Um, it's a little bit like, uh, like hearing music, right? Imagine a favorite song that has been your favorite song for all of your life. Uh, you might call it, I don't know, the Lord's Prayer, right? Which is inscribed in your heart in a really deep way, so deeply that um, for most people, most of us will remember it on the day of our death, right? When we, when, I mean, I've, I've heard stories from Lutheran pastors about how um, they started praying the Lord's Prayer with somebody who's, you know, the last day of their life on their deathbed, and they responded. They weren't responding to anything else, but they knew the Lord's Prayer on the, on the day of their death, right? That's a way that Christ gets inscribed in our hearts, uh, like, like engraved in our hearts, deeper and deeper. And that shapes how we feel and how we act and what we do. And it makes us more and more capable of actually obeying the law of God. Because the law can't do that. Right? All, and and you, you don't even have to be Lutheran to know this. Catholics should know this. Catholics should know this because Augustine said it, right? A thousand years before Luther, right? The law can't give you the power to obey the law. What you need is grace, says Augustine. And the way you find grace is in the gospel, says Luther, right? So let's get into the second half of those letters of Paul again. You've got this church, which is supposed to be living in the image of Christ imperfectly. Um, the law tells you this is how you do it, but it doesn't give you the power to do it. What gives you the power? The preaching of the gospel. Right? So over and over again, the church has to be formed and reformed by hearing this good word about who Jesus is and what he has done. And honestly, I think over time, it really changes people. It really shapes a community that is different um, than before. And then finally, um, let's get this one other aspect of the law to gospel distinction. There's two disasters, I think, that can happen when you think that the law changes things and the law transforms you. One is, uh, if you're a preacher, you think that you can change people's lives by telling them how to change their lives. That may seem kind of obvious, but no, it doesn't work, right? You change people's lives by giving them Jesus. Secondly, when you hear the law preached as if it could change your life, you end up using the law to measure yourself. That's, that's, I think, the, the great disaster because it, it simply makes people anxious, right? J.D. Greer knew that he was supposed to give his life to Jesus and he kept trying to give his life to Jesus and it never was quite good enough, right? Because the law says, do this and, and we never do it well enough. The law as a measuring rod always has us coming up short. So what could possibly give us hope that we're actually gonna learn to obey Jesus? Well, not the law. Right? The law says we don't measure up, but the gospel says you belong to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That happened in your baptism. You have been given the Holy Spirit. By the gift of the Holy Spirit, you shall indeed become more and more Christian. God has this project of making you more and more Christian, right? Um, and therefore- Is this the Christian journey part that you're talking, that you're coming back to? Right. Let's kind of talk about the Christian journey part, because is Drew wanted to make sure that you that you didn't forget. All right. OK, so th there's there's deep issues here. And we're going to have to dig back into Augustine. But here's, I think, how it works in Lutheran preaching or, or Luther's preaching. This is the, the thought I'm, I'm working on in, in the, the next book. Think about the Christian virtue of hope. 
right? Faith, hope, and love. We, we don't often say enough about hope, right? Part of the, the virtue of hope is that we're confident by faith that God is at work in us, right? And it's not based on our experience because sometimes our experience is that I really messed up. And that's why we have to keep on being penitents, right? We, we, we repent on a regular basis and that's a good thing. It's how part of how we make progress on the journey. Um, but what gives us confidence that we really are making progress is the Holy Spirit and the promise of the Holy Spirit, right? When I say Holy Spirit, unlike some of my evangelical friends, um, when I say Holy Spirit, that's not just a code word for my experience. On the contrary, um, the promise of the Holy Spirit is something that I receive by faith alone, not by experience, right? Now, sometimes maybe I can experience the Spirit making me a better person. Every once in a while, I, I, I can notice some real uh, moral progress, um, but I wouldn't wanna put any trust in that. Right. So what I want to do when I get to Paul's um, Paranesis, the second half of the of the, the these letters, is to say, I'm confident that the Holy Spirit is at work in the church to make us into these people who do this. Right. We're commanded to do this, and we should. And you know, um, out of the desire to be, out of gratefulness to God and the desire to please Him, let's give it a try. Um, and then we'll have to repent of our sins. And what gives us hope that we're actually making progress? The promise of the Holy Spirit. Um, let me actually read you one of my very favorite passages from Luther. Um, this is something that if you're Lutheran, you, you learn this as a kid. I'm not Lutheran, so I didn't know about this, but it's, it's just gorgeous. I'll be right back. Um, uh, yeah. We interrupt the regularly scheduled broadcasting. <laughs> bit of catechesis. Um, this is <laughs> Luther's small catechism, right? So this is the kind of thing that, that Lutheran kids would memorize. Uh, used to, maybe some of you have. I don't know if, if Lutherans still do this uh, as much, but um, he, he goes through the, the, the creed, the Ten Commandments, and the Lord's Prayer. When he gets to the end of the creed, when he gets to the article on the Holy Spirit, uh, let's see, let me get to that. Um, preface, Ten Commandments, Creed, here we go. Okay, third article, uh, Sanctification. Um, so this is the article on the Holy Spirit, right? Um, it's sanctification because in Latin it's sanctus spiritus. So sanctification means uh, what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit makes us holy. Sanctification means making holy in Latin. All right. Um, I believe in the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? Luther's answer, and the answer that every Lutheran kid is supposed to memorize. I believe that by my own reason or strength, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ. This is what J.D. Greer needed to learn, right? By my own reason or strength, I cannot believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has, has called, right? Present perfect. That is to say, this has already happened. This has already been completed at the present perfect tense, right? The Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, has enlightened me with his gifts, and has sanctified, but again, past, uh, present perfect, it's already happened, and has preserved me in true faith. Wait a minute, why do I believe that I believe? Because I believe the Holy Spirit has preserved me in true faith. That's how I know I'm a believer. Not because I've made a decision for Jesus, I've made lots and lots of decisions for Jesus. I've made lots of lots of decisions against Jesus. It's called sin, right? So I've made both. So I can't put my trust in decisions for Jesus. What do I put my trust in? The Holy Spirit has preserved me in true faith. I should believe that. Why? Because of the promise of the Holy Spirit that comes from Jesus himself. The Holy Spirit has preserved me in true faith, just as he calls and gathers, enlightens and sanctifies the whole Christian church. Right? And that, again, that's what's happening in Paul's letters when you get to the second half of the letter. Right? He's talking about the life of the church, where sanctification happens through the Holy Spirit. The whole Christian church on earth and preserves it in union with Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit gets us and Christ together in one heart by taking the word of Christ, the gospel, and engraving it on our hearts so that our hearts are Christ-shaped and formed in the image of Christ. 
So, um, and that's why we can hope that we will make progress, right? The Holy Spirit is at work. He's changing us, right? That's a promise. Right? And we should believe that promise, even uh, on the days, uh, even on our worst days, when we realize how much we have failed to obey the law. Right? Um, maybe one more thing about law then. Um, right. Once you understand the point about justification by faith alone, where it's Jesus Christ himself who is your righteousness, who is your savior, who is your justification, and, and it's, it's really not, none of your business to be a good Christian. That's up to, to Christ and the Holy Spirit. Once you get that, then um, once, you, once you understand faith alone as, as the basis of justification, then love has the freedom to be love. I think this is one of the most important things about the Christian life. Um, if you think that you have to make progress and you measure yourself by the law, so this is the disaster of, of the wrong kind of view of progressive uh, progress in the, in the Christian life. If you think you're supposed to make progress and you measure it by the law, then you're going to ask, oh, am I really a loving enough Christian? Have I really loved enough? And Luther's answer to that is, oh, you should always answer no. Right? All of your love is mortal sin, unless God is merciful to you in Christ. Right? So stop thinking that, oh, if I, if I only worked at it hard enough, I would have enough love in my heart to show me that I'm really a Christian, and that would show me that I'm really saved. Right? There is a whole line of thought, um, mostly in the Calvinist tradition, I have to say, which says, oh, if I can look into my heart and see that I'm obeying the law, and I'm sanctified, and I've got the love of God in my heart, then that shows me that I'm really a Christian, and I've really given my heart to Jesus. And, you know, um, which is which is really funny because Calvin had a very low estimation of the heart. <laughs> uh, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, um, factory of idols. I think he called it. a factory of idols. Yeah, Calvin doesn't want us depending on introspection any more than Luther does. I think, however, that Luther has. There's definite reasons why Luther's more successful in avoiding it than Calvin is, and we can talk about that. Um, but so, so here's the the, the pattern that happens is. You know, you take the truth that if you're a believer in Christ, you will end up growing in love because that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does that. And, and that's a promise. Um, but if you measure yourself by the law, then you end up with this problem where love is what tells you whether you really have faith and faith becomes a work. Right. So here you are with, you know, if you're J.D. Greer, right, one way to try to get away from this, this horrible slavery of constantly giving your heart to Christ is to say, well, I'll work at, at, at being a really loving Christian. Because if I'm a really loving Christian, that's evidence that I've really given my heart to Jesus, right? Um, it's assurance of salvation. This is a phrase that gets used by Calvinists all the time. How do you get assurance of salvation? Well, there's really two ways. Now, now I'm sketching what is not Luther and I think is a disaster, right? There's two ways to be assured of salvation. Eh, no, but all right, here, here's how it goes. One is be sure that you've really given your heart to Jesus. You've had a real conversion experience. You've had what Calvin calls the inner call, right? And that experience of, of, of a conversion really shows you that you're really a Christian. That's one way. Um, but then of course, every time you discover that you've made decisions against Jesus, it's like it undoes it. And then you have that anxiety again. Here's the second way. Um, work very, very hard at being sanctified. Work very, very hard at it. Try to be a really, really loving Christian. Try to, 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 to oh, apply what, what, the, what the tradition calls the third use of the law. Um, Luther believes that the law belongs in the life of the Christian and what it'll normally do is it'll show you that you're a sinner, right? So that's why Luther is against antinomianism, right? The law applies to Christians and shows them that they're sinners just like everybody else drives you to Christ over and over again. That's what the law does. It drives you to Christ. That's why you need it. But what happens in sectors of the Calvinist tradition is you're supposed to look at the law and discover that you're obeying it. You're supposed to look at the law and discover that you're getting better at it. You're supposed to look at the law, measure yourself by the law and say, hey, I'm, I'm doing pretty well. I seem to have the Holy Ghost sanctifying me. I seem to have, you know, growing in love so that I'm really showing that I'm really truly a Christian. Right. Thank God I'm not like those other men. Oh, <laughs> yes. 
right. Not, not, <laughs> I mean, like the, right, right. I'm really making, th- and it's by grace alone, of course. And, and it's Jesus working in my heart and, and it's, you know, God is working mightily in my life. And, right. It's a disaster because when you use the law to measure you, you really only have two choices. Either you measure up, and if you think that, then you're self-righteous, right? Or you don't measure up and then you're anxious and terrified and you realize, oh, maybe I'm not a Christian, right? You, you, there's not an, a third option. It's either anxiety or self-righteousness. And you know, it doesn't help to say, oh, I know that I'm really a good loving Christian. It's all, I, I give all the credit to God. I give all the glory to God. I just go around talking about how wonderful God is when he works in my life. And it don't, doesn't make me a, a, a wonderful, um, uh, a wonderful witness and a wonderful display of God's glory and grace. And why do you think I'm an obnoxious, self-righteous jerk? <laughs> but that's what happens. These poor folks who believe in this assurance of salvation stuff, um, an assurance of salvation other than the gospel, they're stuck with either self-righteousness or, or anxiety. Right, and yet their theology doesn't give them an alternative. Right, either you measure up or you don't. Right? Whereas in the Lutheran view, of course you don't measure up. Only Christ measures up, but He gives Himself to you in the gospel. So believe that. Right, uh, and meanwhile you will make progress. I mean, we haven't said enough about progress. I, I need to give you my my Luther heresy, um, and then I'll stop again. And we can ask more questions. I have a Luther heresy as a, as a Luther scholar. I think Luther believes that we make progress in justification and sanctification, and there isn't really a difference between the two. For Luther, sanctification is just justification with your eye on the Holy Spirit sanctifying you. Um, So we make progress all the time. Um, He has a famous little sermon uh, on two kinds of righteousness, and it's not justification and sanctification. It's uh, the righteousness of Christ and the righteousness of our good deeds. And the righteousness of Christ, he says, begins and grows and is perfected at the end of our life. And perfected, by the way, is is an important word. It's a process term because perfection means the completion of a process. Um, In Latin, perfectus means completed. This is why an unfinished symphony is an opus imperfectum, an unfinished, uh, uncompleted work, right? So if you're building a house, the house is imperfect, uncompleted until it's perfected. That's actually Luther's language comes from Aristotle. It's the part of Aristotle that Luther likes. So um, uh, our righteousness in this life is always imperfect, right? But it's always growing, right? Um, Why? Because the Holy Spirit is at work in us, giving us Christ. So the, the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ is infused in us. That's, the, that's Luther's language in, the, in that sermon. And it grows in us. Um, and the, 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 the crucial thing that I think is so different from much of the rest of the Protestant tradition is that we don't try to measure our growth by the law. Right? Um, we hope in, in this rich Christian sense that we are growing. We trust that the Holy Spirit is at work in us because God, Christ has promised. And sometimes we actually see it happening. Sometimes we actually see ourselves growing a bit. But the best place to look to see people growing in holiness and righteousness and sanctification is in the church, right? Again, well, a whole lot of this move from gospel to law or from the first half of the epistle to the second half of the epistle makes more sense when you realize the second half of the epistle, of the epistle is, is you plural. It's, it's about the community, right? If you want to see what sanctification looks like, look at some other Christians. Right? Now, some of them will be messing up and need to repent and need church discipline, right? But some of them will be growing in ways that are really a great encouragement. And they may not see it themselves because actual, if, if, you're, um, if you're a healthy Christian, <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll be more and more aware of your sin the more holy you are, right? This is a standard paradox about sainthood and, and, and all the, the people who get deep in the faith and the love of, of Christ is they know their imperfections better than anybody else. Um, but when you can look at them and say, look, look what the difference is that, that Christ has made. Look what the difference is that has been made by, by, in this person, by the fact that they're in the church, that they're in the body of Christ, right? It really has made a difference. I look at myself and I'm not so sure because I know my own sins better than other people do. And I ought to know them better. It's Lent. I ought to get to know my sins a bit better. Um, but, but I can see, I mean, and I can, I mean, quite, quite frankly, I, I can see Christ at work in other folks in the church. 
Um, and I think that's, that's something that's deeply encouraging. We are making progress, right? And we can even see it. And sometimes you, sometimes you can even see it in yourself. Although in Lent, you, you're better off confessing your sins, right? But maybe on Easter, you can say, look, something happened in Lent that made me just a little bit better of a Christian. That's not assurance of salvation, right? The assurance of salvation is your baptism. Oh, let me say one more thing about that. Um, right, so, so the assurance of salvation thing is, is, is a disaster because you're using the law to, to, to measure yourself. And then the, the other way of trying to assure yourself of salvation is, is this thing where, where you, you have a real conversion experience, you really give your heart to Jesus. And a whole lot of Protestantism is based on the notion that that's the beginning of your Christian life. When you really give your life to Jesus, right? That's the beginning of your Christian life. So how do you know you're a Christian? Well, I gave my heart to Jesus. That's the, the answer you're supposed to give. Now, if you ask Luther, how do you know you're a Christian? Do you really know you're a Christian? Luther's answer is absolutely unmistakable. I'm baptized is his answer, right? Because that's the beginning of the Christian life for, for Luther. Because baptism contains the gospel, contains God's word. Right? When a pastor or anyone baptizes you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's Christ's word. It's as if Jesus Christ himself were saying, you belong to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You, your old self has been drowned and killed in, 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 in the waters of baptism, and you now are beginning a new life. Right? That's how you know you're Christian. Right? Just that, might be a good place, that might be a good place, Dr. Carey, to ask. Uh, Terry's question is, from a practical standpoint, can you talk a little about our unbelief and doubt and what we're supposed to do when they rear their heads? Right, okay, unbelief and doubt, right. Uh, Luther had a very dramatic approach to this, right? Um, the idea was not that you're supposed to know for sure that you have true saving faith. That's the, that's the, the Calvinist kind of notion of, of assurance of salvation, um, where you look at your own heart and you see that you have true saving faith. Um, I can talk about why that works the way it does. Um, but in Luther, it works differently. You look at your heart and you see that, that very often you're an unbeliever. Um, you look in your heart and you, you find yourself, Luther puts it this way, you, you get it to a point where you, you only wish that you could believe, right? Um, and um, this is why, I'm gonna take a brief detour here. This is why you don't baptize people because they've made a confession of faith, right? We don't know whether we believe, right? And the person who believes most deeply, and here's, here's the, the deep point, the person who believes most deeply and strongly is the one who's in despair and doesn't believe that he believes. The person who merely wishes they could believe, you know, God, you know, Lord, help my, my Lord, I believe, I help my unbelief, or um, you just, you, you sigh and you wish you could believe. And Luther says, that sigh is the Holy Spirit. And it is a mighty cry for mercy in the ears of God in heaven, right? When you simply wish you could be a believer and you don't really believe you can possibly believe, that's, that's the mightiest belief of all because you're fighting, you're fighting the devil, Luther thinks, right? The devil is the liar who wants you not to believe. And the, the struggle for faith is, is over and over again, the struggle against the assaults of the devil. Uh, let me use that language for a bit because it is Luther's language. He talks about what he calls Anfechtung, it's a kind of famous phrase, it means assault. Um, it, it's not a uniquely German notion. Uh, in, in, throughout Latin Middle Ages, the, the devils assaulted you, right? And they assault you by telling you, well, you think you're a Christian, huh? Well, I know some, you know in your heart, about how, how dedicated you are to Jesus, Mr. Greer. We know how, you know in your own heart and conscience that you're not very, very, you haven't really given your heart to Jesus. You know that, come on, fess up, right? What are you gonna do about the fact that you're not really a believer in Jesus? Right? And um, what, well, what you do is you say, get out of here, devil. Jesus promised that he's my savior and I don't, and I don't have to listen to you. I'm gonna listen to Jesus instead, right? Um, Luther had that kind of battle just about every night, it seems. Um, he would wake up in the middle of the night, he was a big insomniac, and he'd be fighting with the devil. He'd be fighting with the voices in his head or his heart that are saying, Martin, you're not really a Christian. You're leading people to hell by d defying the Pope. Who do you think you are? Your theology is crap. You know, um, you're damned and you're damning everybody else. And Luther will say, get out of here. I'm gonna believe the gospel instead. 
I have a right to believe the promise of Christ instead of your lies. I have, a, I have a right to believe the promise of Christ instead of the lies of my own heart. Let God be true and every man a liar. So even if my heart is, is really crappy at believing, I still have a right to believe that Jesus is my savior. So go away. And then Luther would go around and he'd turn around and, and show, show the devil his backside and, and um, st- you know, let out a little stink at the devil just to, to make him go away and you know, then go back to sleep. Um, he, Luther's kind of earthy about that kind of thing. I mean, he, it's fairly clear that he would actually fart at the devil in his bed and, and say, go away. All right. Um, that's, that's, that's what you do with the devil, right? You make fun of him if you can. Um, yeah, so, so always because faith is commanded, you always have a right to believe. You don't have to think, oh, I have to make the decision first. No, you don't have any decision to make. God commanded you to believe, therefore you have a right to believe, right? You are permitted to believe because God said you have to, right? Um, the commandment has the structure of a must that's really in service of a may, right? And, and this is language from Karl Barth, but Barth, I think, just, just nails this one, right? Yeah, right. The commandments of God tell you what you have to do so that you know what you may do. You can trust that Christ is your savior because you're commanded to believe that. And yeah, that's often a struggle. Um, but don't believe the lies. Believe the, the gospel instead. Um, and don't think that your salvation depends on your sincerity of faith, right? Trust that. So that's, so, that's, so that's great. Go ahead. Because um, uh, there's a question that uh, Ken asked. Uh, it, well, it's really more. You can answer this in true or false, so <laughs> it it should be an easy question. Uh, so Ken's, Ken's way of just saying something. Is this Ken, Ken Tanner? He, he's been yeah, it's he, Ken yeah. Tanner stalking exactly. me for a long time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ken. He he also asked really really cool questions. So yeah. So uh, he uh, yeah he formed this uh, in, in in as an if then. Okay. So if if you cannot do anything to be saved and Christ has done it all, then it follows that there is nothing you can do to lose what you did not gain for yourself in the first place. True or false? Oh, nothing. Mm. Oh, right. Okay, Luther's answer to this is going to be, and I, I my answer may not be Luther's, so, so that, that's why I'm making this distinction. Luther's answer to this is going to be, you can reject Christ as resolutely as you, as you can. Um, uh, Melanchthon, t- in fact, follows that trail to the end. Um, that um, you can resolutely reject Christ. It's possible. Um, and um, this is where the terror of predestination comes in, because God knows what, what, whether you're going to get the grace to, to persevere in faith to the end. Um, but on the other hand, you always have the option of, of believing the promise again. The promise is never revoked. It's like, um, you know, a wedding vow. You can commit adultery right and left, but, but you've got a spouse who's, who's willing to take you back. And that promise is always there. Um, but, um, right, so, so um, and, and your baptism, by the way, is, is you, there's nothing you can do to revoke your baptism. Right? You can't unbaptize yourself. So um, that's always there. Um, but Luther thinks, sure, you really are capable of rejecting Christ uh, utterly and finally, um, although he thinks that you never have a right to believe that you've done that, right? You never have a right to give up hope, right? You never have a right to think that you've actually succeeded in rejecting Christ. Um, and that, that's good pastoral advice. Um, but yeah, I... I you see, Luther's views can be so dire and so dark, and then just take one further step and, and you get good news that's so good that it's actually hard to believe. But, you know, suppose, well, suppose Christ died for the sins of the whole world. You know, suppose he came to save the whole world. You know, there, are, there are scriptural passages that suggest that, right? He came for the salvation of the world. Um, well, suppose he gets what he wants. It's really possible, isn't it? Um, And and this is now a a big issue in theology um, for various reasons, probably mainly because David Bentley Hart has put this on the table, right? Although David Bentley Hart has no clue about Protestantism. So don't trust him whenever he says anything about Protestantism 
or most of Augustine too, especially the side of Augustine that Protestants like. Um, but you know, suppose that that Christ died to save the world, and he gets what he wants, right? Um, so um, it may be that that we never fully escape from the from the love of God, right? Um, and that wouldn't make me unhappy at all. Um, um, your, but, your your comment there, your comment there, really, I think uh, it, it, it's a good distinction because if we think that telling people how to be transformed is how they're transformed, then pastoral ministry chiefly becomes advice giving. Yes. And, and, none, of, and none of us are trained to be advice givers. Yeah. Um, if we understand that people are transformed by hearing the gospel, um, we are trained to do that. A and there are pastoral implications that then come out of that that can be given as advice. Like that, that, that those are two very different things. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, when you think about your, your job as a preacher, right, um, you know, your, your job is to tell this, this glad story, right, and, and to, to well, you, you, the, the job is to tell the story well um, in ways that show us our beloved, right, and, and help us see that, that this, is, this is our beloved who wants to save us and who, who intends to get his way and has made promises that, he, that it, he's our bridegroom. Um, uh, and we can, and we therefore can say, this is, you know, I am my beloved's and he is mine, right? So I think a pastor's job, because it's tied up with faith, hope, and love is, is, is resolutely joyful and cheerful. Um, um, yeah, um, there are dark moments to deal with, but, but always in the light of the fact that Christ is our redeemer. Um, and, and since the theme of the gospel is who Jesus is and what he has done, the gospel is always glad tidings, um, which is really, I think, we yeah, have quite different than giving people advice. <laughs> I, I just wanted to, Tr Troy put something in the chat that I thought was, was, was funny and also relevant to what we're, to what we're talking about. And, uh, the good thing about universal salvation is that it means I at least am getting in. <laughs> that the good news, that the good news of universal salvation is that even the worst of Christians can make it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, now uh, I, this is, is where universalism can go wrong. Um, you should be afraid enough that you, you, you cling to the promise of Christ in the face of, of those, those doubts and fears, right? Um, this is, I think, one of the reasons why someone like Luther is never gonna go universalist, right? He wants the law and the fear of God to be serious enough to make us realize, oh, if there is such a thing as a hell, then then it, it, it's the place that that I'm heading toward if I don't watch out, right? So, the, the kind of universalism that that David Hart wants us not to endorse, which is I think has been very common in the Catholic tradition for the past 30, 40 years, is is associated with the name of von Balthasar, which is they call it hopeful universalism. Like, von Balthasar writes this book, um, "Dare we hope that all men might be saved." And the answer is clearly yes, but it's a dare, right? May we hope this? Yes, we may hope this. But von Balthasar also says, but you know, we know from the reality of our own, from the reality of our own hearts, we know that hell is possible, right? And um, so, my thought about this is universalism, as an abstract proposition, is not ultimately that hopeful because I'm going to encounter the times when I am a really miserable sinner. And what I need at that point is not an abstract doctrine of universalism, but the promise of Christ. Right? I need to cling to Christ's promise for dear life. Um, yeah, and, and, and so, so I, I, although I'm not unhappy about universalism, I don't think that's the gospel. Right? The gospel is centered on this very specific promise that Christ makes to us that we need to cling to because, um, well, because there's a lot to be anxious about in this world and a whole lot of it is, is, is what's in my heart. Yeah. Um, so we've got a lot of great questions and I think we are going to have, I, I've, I've written them down elsewhere so that we don't forget them. Um, so we're going to have down and yeah, we can pick up where we left off. Away. No, no yeah, question. and and uh, but we want to. Um, I wanted to bring bring Drew Drew asked the first question. He asked another question that's a good uh, way for us to close out this session. I think. Okay. Um, 
which is that Sunday's gospel lection Mm -hmm. is from Mark um, when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Mm -hmm. Um, So given everything that we have said uh, uh, today and all of the, uh, you know, intersecting uh, narratives that we've weaved in, um, how should Protestants preach that text? Ooh, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, in context, uh, historical context, I mean, Mark is probably the earliest gospel, um, but Christians have been worshiping the exalted Christ for, for probably decades by the time Mark had written down the gospel, right? Um, you know, the, the, the epistles are earlier as writings than the gospels are. And one of the things that, that you know, all the epistles make it very clear, the Christian community is a bunch of people worshiping Jesus exalted at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Right. Um, they believe that he, he was crucified, dead, buried, rose from the dead, ascended at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and he is Lord. And every knee is going to bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That him in Philippians 2 might be the earliest piece of Christian writing that we know of. Right. Um, so it's, it's the exalted Jesus who is Lord, which is to say the name of the Lord God of Israel belongs rightly to him. And he sits rightly on the throne of God. And that's glory. Right. And that's, I think, part of the reason why the Gospel of Mark comes along and says, yeah, and Peter, after you confess that Christ is the Son of God, and then take up your cross and follow, right? And it's just sort of, the Gospel of Mark throws a lot of cold water on the glory and says, you got to take up a cross now, right? Um, so yes, there's glory. Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. He's coming again in glory, but take up the cross and follow him. So how do yeah so that's that's part of it, um, but how do we preach the cross as good news? Right? Um, the first chapter of the book I'm trying to write now called Gospel Ethics is about the gospel of the cross. Why is the cross good news? Um, and here Karl Barth helped me right. Um, what does God intend from the very beginning? He intends that His beloved Son will spill His blood for us. From the very beginning, he is God for us in suffering and death and and judgment that falls upon him, right? So the cross is this good news that this is what God is willing to go through for us and for our salvation. The cross is this good news that that love is willing to go this far. Divine love is willing to go this far. Um, Let me say a few things that are are not necessarily barred. Um, Suffering means things that are done to you. It's called the passion of Jesus because it's the opposite of action, right? Passion and action are opposites in Latin. Uh, In older English, it's doing and suffering. When you're suffering, you can't do anything. Maybe your hands are nailed up to a a cross and what can you do but but slowly die, right? Um, Our suffering is something we don't choose. You know, we we didn't choose to be born. We don't choose to die. Um, We didn't choose to be mortals. We didn't, all right? in a deep sense, we didn't choose our own suffering. We didn't choose our humanity. We didn't choose to be born. God chose all those things. The eternal son of God cho- chose to be born. The only, the only human being who ever chose to be born. The only human being who ever chose to be mortal. The only human being who ever chose to be a sufferer is God. <laughs> because so in God, suffering is a deed. Suffering is an action. Right? The, the, the passion is an action of God. Uh, actually, Augustine gets this, right? The passion of Christ is something that God, Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit do, right? And, he, and why do they do it? Well, out of love for us, for us and for our salvation. This cross is the best news in the world because this is how deep God is willing to go to love us. Um, one, more, one more thought about that, and, and then we can, we can pick up on the theme of the cross next time because that, that's, that's you know, such a deep, deep theme. Um, Jesus compares the cross to the, the bronze serpent that, that Moses holds up in the desert, right? Um, and I, heard a, I once heard a really lovely sermon about that. As a matter of fact, you were talking about how to preach this, right? about how the serpent, the bronze serpent, is an image of what's terrifying us, right? Because we, we're ancient Israelites, the serpents are biting us, and we're dying. Right? And here's this image of what is destroying us. And yet it's an image of hope. We look to it, the thing that we're afraid of, and it, it transforms us in a way that, that frees us from our ills. 
I used to say, I look at the cross and this is not what I want. It's an, you know, it's an instrument of torture. I don't like this. I don't like suffering and death, right? But if I see that this is how God endures suffering and death in order to defeat them, right? Because he loves us so much that he's willing to suffer like this for our, us and our salvation. If we listen to Julian of Norwich, where, where Jesus says to her, I hope you don't mind that, that I suffer so much for you. And I love you so much that I suffer. If I could have suffered more for you, I would, says Jesus to Julian, right? Like, yes, right? Um, you look at what terrifies you, what horrifies you, what you, what you want to spend your whole life avoiding, and you see that God is there, and he's turning it into salvation. Um, that is, well, th th that gets to the, to the depth of things, and it means that, that even in our suffering, which we don't want, which we didn't choose, unlike God, who did choose it, um, in, in our suffering, we can have hope because God did this for us. So um, yeah, it, it's absolutely crucial that this taking up the cross, and I should say this last thing, when we take up the cross, we're participating in what Christ has done, uh, imitating his love, being willing to suffer for the sake of our neighbors. Um, and um, that is, is getting on board. From, yeah, that's, it's moving from the first part of the epistle to the second part, where we get to participate in what Christ is doing out of love for our neighbors. Um, last thing, no, actually two last things. Why do we paint so many crucifixions, right? Over the course of Western histories, right? It's like, this is the most beautiful thing in the world to paint, isn't it? Right? I mean, just like Madonna and child and crucifixions. Those are the two most beautiful paintings you can have, right? Uh, or, or think of Bach, right? The Lutheran thing, right? Um, there is a, and I'll, I really will quit with this one. There is a moment in the St. John Passion. <laughs> right, right. I mean, it's the St. John Passion. Okay, so this is Bach's crucifixion painting, right? But he's not painting, he's painting with music, right? And um, he gets to the moment where Pilate puts the superscription on the cross, right? Um, and all four gospels have the same thing, right? Um, what is he guilty of? Um, he, right, I, I'm, well, we'll wait for it. Uh, what is he guilty of? Uh, now, the, the recitative, most of the, the, the words being said about the narrative are in minor key. Right? And then all of a sudden, the, the words on the superscription of the cross are this golden major key. Jesus von Nazareth, der Juden König. And all of a sudden, this, the, the golden light of the sunlight of God shines out through all of it, through the irony that the pilot has no idea what he's saying, but he's saying the truth, which happens all the time in the Gospel of John, where people have no idea what they're saying, but they're saying the truth. And God takes everything that's awful, and he turns it to gold, and it's, and it's the corona around the head of Jesus on the cross, right? That's the, that's the cross. That's the good news of the cross. Pilate tells us it, even though he doesn't get it, right? Um, so, so we could start there, and and, and David, if, if you can write down all those questions, we could start by just doing question and answer, and, and go from there. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've got them, I've got them written down. So okay. we will. Uh, all right. We'll get Thank you, that. Dr. Carey. Uh, Taylor, will you pray us out? So this is from uh, Luther's uh, catechism, a small catechism. This is uh, an evening prayer, and it's written for individuals, but I'm going to speak uh, for all of us when I pray this. So let's pray. Thank you. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept us this day. And we pray that you would forgive us all of our sins where we have done wrong and graciously keep us this night. For into your hands we commend ourselves, our bodies, our souls, and all things. Let your holy angel be with us, that the evil foe may have no power over us. Amen. Amen. And it says, go to sleep at once and in good cheer. <laughs>